Okay. Uh, any English speakers around? Hebrew, everyone? Fine. Oh, English. It's fine. Don't worry. Yeah, let's wait another minute. Everyone, fill in. Okay. So, hi, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. Uh, we're uh, very happy to have today Or the Mir. Uh, or is currently a postdoc at uh, Princeton and IAS. Uh, and before that, uh, he did uh, his PhD here with uh, Uli and uh, Chaim, um, during which uh, he has won some uh, prestigious awards, like uh, Best Student Paper at ICOV and the Blavatnik Award. Um, and Or has a broad interest in uh, applying uh, graph theory and combinatorics uh, in theoretical CS. And uh, you tell us about it today. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks everyone for showing up. It's a decent amount of people. It's a good idea. So hide the mouse. Good. Um, okay, you made a very good call by not spelling out the title. It's a bit long. There are Several terms in it. Can somebody move the cursor away? Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't expect you to know all of the terms in here. It would even be peculiar as I made one of them up, but I will <laughs> go into the definition of all of them. And let's start with the easiest one, which is algorithms. And more particularly, let's talk about algorithms for restricted inputs. So for many different problems, we know that if we assume something about the inputs, we can solve the problem faster. I don't even bother listing examples because I'm certain all of us have enough examples in mind. What I do want to list examples of is what types of restrictions do we usually put in on inputs to make the problems easier to solve. One type of very common restriction uh, we are putting on inputs is to say that they need to be sparse. So for example, if we are talking about graphs, this can mean something as weak as just not having a lot of edges, but it can also mean something that is much uh, a more stronger uh, notion of sparsity, like having bounded degree, all of the vertices and degrees bounded by a constant, or having some type of structural sparsity, like being planar or having bounded tree width and so on. Another type of restricted families of inputs for which we tend to have better algorithms for uh, many problems are random inputs. A random can mean different things, but uh, in a sense, average inputs, inputs are uh, many times easier to solve problems on. And our objective in the work I will present today is to get some general approach to show that for a large class of problems and a large class of inputs, you can inherently solve these problems faster if you assume that the input is within this large family. And the type of family we will discuss is something we will call almost regular inputs. And for graphs, for example, this would mean that the maximum degree in the graph is at most larger by a constant factor than the average degree. So I don't require anything about the minimum degree. I just want the maximum one to be at most a constant times the average. And this, for example, includes a couple of the families we discussed before. So bounded degree graphs are almost regular in this sense random graphs with a small footnote about what exactly is the density are also almost regular in this sense, but it also includes a lot of families that we don't tend to have faster algorithms for. For example, regular graphs of arbitrarily high degree are obviously also almost regular. Also, every very dense graph will be almost regular because if I have at least epsilon fraction of all possible edges, then the average degree is linear, the maximum degree is obviously not more than linear, so this is almost regular as well in this sense. And the type of results we would want to get are things like, if I can solve maximum independent set in some time, let's say C to the N, then if I assume that the input is almost regular, then I can solve it in C minus epsilon to the N. So no matter how fast the general case algorithm is, if I assume that the input is nice, I can get much quicker, or at least uh, I can shave off an exponential factor. 
And this type of results, we will call them black box results, meaning that I don't care what is the algorithm for the general case, I can improve it. Uh, we will see the, the main result of this type is going to be for KSA. And also we are going to see white box results, meaning that I do assume something about the running time I'm trying to get. So I'm not comparing myself to an arbitrary algorithm, but to the current best one or to the conjectured optimal algorithm or something like this. The main result of this form is going to be for graph coloring. And all of those examples that I'm now mentioning are examples of problems in uh, NP, NP complete problems. And the type of algorithms you are going to discuss for them are going to be exact algorithms to solve them. So let's do a short detour to discuss exact algorithm for NP complete problems. So first of all, we don't believe that these type of problems should have efficient solutions. Many or most of us believe that uh, P doesn't equal NP, so we shouldn't have efficient algorithms. Even for many of these problems, we believe that the best algorithms should be exponential. Nevertheless, for maybe all of the interesting NP-complete problems, we still have non-trivial algorithms. Meaning that even if the algorithm is not efficient, we can do better and sometimes much, much better than just the trivial enumeration solution or something like this. And actually we knew this long before we defined what NP is. So in the early 60s, already Eld and Karp had, a, had an algorithm for TSP running in exponential time in, a, in the number of vertices and not in n factorial time. And of course, after we understood how important this class of problems is, there are hundreds of papers on this type of, uh, of algorithms. And one question we can ask ourselves is why? Why do we care about these uh, algorithms for uh, exact algorithms for these problems? So classically, there were two main reasons. One of them is that people wanted to solve them, right? It, uh, it's not very satisfying to say, okay, this is NPR, so I have nothing to do. People wanted to, to solve SAT instances. People wanted to solve TSP. People want even to solve some of these uh, problems, problems that we don't have efficient algorithms for in the worst case. For example, people want to factor numbers without assuming that they get some average case thing and so on. And another reason that is uh, closer to heart to all of us doing theory is that we don't really understand hardness in general, but hardness, we, hardness within NP particularly almost at all. We don't even know whether or not we can solve SAT in linear time. So understanding the, the hardness of specific problems or in which cases they are easy and so on is, a, is important for our understanding of the theory. But also there are newer reasons newer reasons is to care about these algorithms. One of them is something that is uh, coming from fine-grained complexity. So what is this field? In recent years, uh, this became very popular. So this is a field in which we take the classical type of statements then that we add in complexity, which are usually something like, if I assume some well-believed conjecture, if I assume that NP doesn't equal P, then, for example, I can deduce that there is no polytime algorithm that solves this uh, specific problem that I care about. I don't have a polynomial time algorithm for click. And something that people started doing somewhat recently is to try to replace this type of implication with something that is more fine-grained. Let's talk about polynomial problems and say something that is uh, more fine-grained, more concrete about the running time. But to do that, they needed to replace the assumptions that they are assuming to things that are more quantitative. So for example, one of the most popular assumptions that people are using is something called the strong exponential time hypothesis, or CEPH, which is roughly saying that you can't solve SAT much faster than two to the N. And if you assume something like this, then suddenly, instead of just deducing that something is not a polynomial, you can deduce something like there is no N to the two minus epsilon algorithm for any constant epsilon solving graph diameter. So for specific problems and specific polynomial running times, we can get conditional lower bounds conditioned on this uh, type of conjectures. This field was um, more or less started and popularized by Amira Bud and Virginia Vasilevska Williams around 2014. They initially showed that you can get this type of results in uh, several different fields. They showed it for this uh, graph diameter example and the related problems, then for string problems like LCA, for dynamic problems like dynamic reachability and so on, 
We also had some joint work showing that you can also get these four three related problems, say sub three isomorphism and, uh, and other things. And since then it really caught on. So people nowadays in every big TCS co uh, conference, you can see dozens of these papers in more or less every subfield of computer science. It became kind of standard to, to have this type of statements. It is still a very active area of research. I would shamelessly advertise uh, another recent result. Something that remained open is translating a lot of this uh, exact conditional lower bounds to uh, approximation lower bounds. So recently, again, with Amir, but also with Carl Brinkman and uh, Seri Khouri, we showed that you can do this, translate a lot of them from exact to approximation algorithms. So we get, for example, tight bounds uh, for distance oracles, again, conditional on this type of conjectures. And the main point in this detour is that all of these fields, all of those conditional lower bounds are based upon conjectures on the exact running times for algorithms for some problems in, a, in NP or some NP complete problems. So if you want to believe those lower bounds or refute those conjectures that, uh, that people use for these lower bounds, we need a better understanding of these uh, exact algorithms for NP-complete oh, problems. One historical remark, I don't know, perhaps you don't consider this to be of the family, but there's a paper from the mid-90s by Obermarks and a student reducing dozens of problems to three sum. It's all there from 1995. It's true that it's not based on the exact running time of NP problems, or excuse also, perhaps because of your age, you are excused. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's the beginning of many of these results started in 1995 paper about reducing problems with research. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's true. There's also like some uh, couple of works in the middle of Brian Williams in which he reduced some things to orthogonal vectors. Yeah, so there are, there are a few things of the similar true, form before the, that. The main, uh progress was that all these problems that we talk about were in computational geometry. Besides the basic problems, yes. Besides yes. threesome and what they call threesome tag and that and the yes, uh, yes, so I agree, but um, yeah, this is where it started to uh, boil up to much larger um yeah, grasp of fields in computer science and so on. Um Okay, one other reason that I wanted to mention, even though this is not very new, uh, which is also strongly related to cryptography, is that since the very beginning of uh, academic cryptography, the early papers of uh, Diffie and Hellman, we wanted to be able to base cryptographic, uh, cryptographic elements on conjectures like P versus NT or conjectures that we believe in complexity theory, it seems like a very big roadblock to do that, but also a question that is interesting in complexity, regardless of this, is to find R distributions for problems in NP. Meaning that a very big open problem now is that we can't find any distribution of inputs for a problem in NP, for which we can show that it is NP hard to solve the problem on something that you draw out of this distribution. And what we show in this work in a sense implies that natural distributions inherently cannot be worst case for many of these entry problems. Because we know that inputs that are symmetric in some sense are inherently easier than the worst case inputs. It still doesn't mean that it's not, uh, not in NP, but just that it's not the, the worst case, which means that if you want a distribution that would really give you the worst case scenario for some problem, you need to do something that would be somewhat unnatural, somewhat uh, very not symmetric within the degrees. Still, it so on. might be that uniform distribution would correct, right? Uh, yes, but it could, it can be not great, the but one. not the not the best, not one. best one. But still, and we still. see a lot of uh, a lot of such examples. So whenever people uh, raised candidates like random case, for example, and so on, people did come up with better algorithms in comparison to the current best one. But this shows that this is somewhat inherent. This, uh, this, again, also if we aim for the extreme, for exponential time, or also it scales down, it scales for any running time. What so time? what we are presenting now is for exponential time problems, mostly. But we'll talk about this again. OK, good. So next, we are going to talk about two specific results. First, we will talk about cases. So a quick reminder, what is the sub problem or cases problem? 
in the SAT problem, you are given a Boolean formula. You want to decide whether or not it is satisfied, whether or not you have some assignments to the variables for which the formula could be satisfied. Um, and what is the KSAT problem? This is a restriction of SAT in which the input is given in KCNF form. So what is CNF form? In CNF form, we have clauses separated by end gates, where each clause is a bunch of literals separated by OR gates, and the literal is either a variable or its negation. KCNF is the same thing, in which every clause is of size exactly K, or at most K, depending on the definition you like. SAT, of course, is the first problem that we showed that uh, that was a uh, NP complete and very early afterwards in the first reductions paper by CARP, it was shown that K SAT is NP complete as long as K is uh, at least free. So it is polynomial for uh, two SAT, but afterwards it is NP complete. And in terms of exact solutions for SAT, we actually don't know any, almost anything besides the very naive thing you can do. So the best known algorithm for SAT takes roughly to the end time, meaning that there are actually very clever algorithms that shave off some sub-exponential factors, but many people believe that you shouldn't be able to do more than this. This is this uh, strong exponential time hypothesis, this set we discussed before, is more or less saying that you can't shave off an exponential factor from this two to the end. But when you talk about K SAT for a specific constant K, the problem does become slightly easier. So we know that for any specific K, for any constant K, you can solve K sat in two minus epsilon K to the N time, meaning that you can shave off an exponential factor for every K. And this we actually knew since the mid eighties. So the first result of this form that was still true for uh, every K was by uh, Monier and uh, Speckenmeyer in 85, there was a relatively long list of improvements until a very similar result of Paturi, Pudlak, Sachs, and Zane. This is usually called the PPSZ algorithm. They gave a very simple, elegant, uh, randomized algorithm that had a very complicated analysis, but the algorithm uh, was very natural. Somewhat recently, together with uh, Thomas Hansen, with Chaim, and with Uri, we improved upon that for every K. And even more recently, Dominic Scheder improved at least for K equals three upon uh, our result uh, furthermore. And the last thing I wanted to, to mention about KSAT before we will go for, uh, to our result is some part of another seminal paper of Impagliazzo, Paturi, and Zane, in which they also showed something called the SAT specification lemma or the KSAT specification lemma, which roughly states that KSAT is the hardest when the, when the amount of clauses is linear in the amount of the variables. What do I mean by that? For every K and every positive epsilon, you can take a KCNF formula that you want to solve SAT on and reduce it to two to the epsilon N, where again, epsilon is as small as you want formulas, such that each formula is on the same number of variables but the number of clauses in each formula is linear in the number of variables. So this constant would depend on K, it would depend on this epsilon that you choose, but it is a constant for each uh, choice of them, which roughly means that you can reduce the general problem of KSA to the sparse problem. If I have an exponentially faster algorithm for the sparse case, then I have an exponentially faster algorithm for the general case. What we show in this work, and we didn't have this type of statement before is that the complementing thing is also true. Meaning that I would want to say that if I have a lot of clauses, then I actually am strictly faster than in the general case. What do I mean by that? So we are showing that if K sat can be solved in C to the end time, so I don't assume anything about this constant C, then K sat can be solved in C minus epsilon to the end time on formulas that contain at least some large linear amount of clauses, but we also need to require that these clauses are well spread, which I didn't define here. Well spread would basically mean that they, that I still have a lot of clauses if I remove a tiny fraction of the vertices, which is inherent because otherwise I can just add a few vertices and a lot of clauses on them. But if my clauses survive the removal of any tiny fraction of uh, uh, vertices, then actually having a large number of linear clauses makes me exponentially faster, meaning I can shave off an uh, an exponent to solve. 
Uh, so the constant will depend on on both uh, on both c and k and this definition of well spreads. And obviously, this constant would be higher than what you get from the specification. Right? So you can't just uh, bootstrap yourself. Yes, but uh, this kind of completes the, the picture saying that uh, the sparse case is strictly the hardest case and not just uh, so, so yes. if you more closes makes it make, makes the problem easier. Yes. Yeah, so this shows because that you think it's good to refute it. I mean, uh, uh, what, what's the rationale that more closes make it? Easier? So we will, uh, I mean, soon we will go to techniques and see kind of what uh, what is the reason for these things, but uh, at least. Intuitively, this is a very natural thing to say, right? I have more constraints. It should be easier, easier to, to refute. Easier to refute, yes. Which is, yeah, maybe. Yes. Not to refute. It's not to yes. Sense, basically. yes, but I mean, this this intuition is not something that we could formalize yeah. before. Satisfying assignment. Stand up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, the other problem that I want to talk about is graph coloring. Again, let's very quickly go over the definition because this is again something that I suppose most of us know. A graph is k-colorable. If we can color its vertices with k-colors, meaning assign a number between one to k to each of its vertices, such that no edge is monochromatic, meaning it connects the two vertices that were assigned the same color. Uh, such, a, such a graph will be called k-colorable if we can color it with k-colors. And the coloring problem or the problem of computing the chromatic number is finding the minimal k such that the graph is k-colorable. This is again NP-complete, again from the first paper of CARP of uh, reductions within NP. And also we can ask ourselves what happens if I don't want to compute the chromatic number, but just to decide whether or not something is k-colorable for a specific k. And this is again NP-complete as long as k is at least <laughs> For k equals two, this is just checking if the graph is bipartite. This is a polynomial, even linear, but uh, for every k that is larger than this, this is NP-complete. And the next question as before would be, so how fast can we solve those problems? And now the naive bound actually grows with k. The naive bound for checking whether or not something is k-colorable is k to the end, just going over all, uh, all, possible, uh, all possible colorings. But very early on, people understood that you can do better than this. So a very simple dynamic problem, uh, dynamic program suggested by Lawler in the mid 70s shows that you can compute the chromatic number in three to the end time, regardless of what the chromatic number is. And it is based on the following simple observation. A graph is k-colorable if and only if you can partition the vertex set to k-independent sets. Right, because if I have a valid coloring, then every color class is an independent set. And also, if you give me an independent set, then I can color all of the vertices in, uh, in this independent set with the same color without refuting anything. So this, this uh, gives you this simple dynamic program of just let's compute the chromatic number of every induced subgraph. If we will do this from the smallest induced subgraphs to the largest induced subgraphs, then we will always be able to peel off one independent set in a sense. And this would take three to the end because I'm going over all subsets and then every subset of each subset. And this was again improved many times with uh, many clever ideas until finally in 2009, Bjorkland et al showed that you can compute the chromatic number in two to the end time. This was conjectured before that by uh, several people for several, several reasons to be optimal and people still believe that this should be the, the best you can do. And then the next natural question is what can you do for a specific case if you just want to decide K colorability? So again, graph coloring in general can be solved in two to the end time, similar to SAT, what happens for a specific case? So unfortunately, the picture now is not as complete as it was for SAT and KSA. So we did know for a while that for k equal uh, three, this is by Beagle and Epstein, and for k equal four, this is for min et al. You can solve k coloring uh, exponentially faster, meaning shaving off an exponent um, than two to the n. Recently, I showed that this is also true for five and six, but this is still open for general k. We still don't know if for every k, you can uh, shave off something exponential for just deciding k colorability. The only thing that we did know in the general case 
and this is from the same recent paper I mentioned, is that for some general definition of sparsity, you can do better. So let me state the statement. For every delta and alpha, they can be any constants you want. You can compute the chromatic number in two minus epsilon to the n time. If your graph has at least alpha fraction of its vertices of degrees bounded by delta. So this means, for example, that if your graph is sparse, then you can solve it faster because half of the vertices would be of degrees bounded by a, by a constant. For the sake of this talk, we will just need the, the following simple corollary, which is that the chromatic number can be solved faster than two to the n if all of the degrees are bounded by a constant. So this is just setting alpha to zero to one. Good. And what we show in this work is that actually you can solve this general conjecture if you assume that the graph is almost regular in the sense we mentioned. So for every k and every c, we can solve k coloring in two minus epsilon to the n time if the maximum degree is at most c times the average degree. It should be like uh, uh, always, I guess, in general, we have to have like very few uh, very great uh, point so in all of this uh, in many of these anti complete problems you can allow yourself to enumerate over a small uh, part of the uh, of the variable set but it should be like putting on the side like uh, something you can enumerate like so yes function. even if even if you have like a very small like linear fraction but this small would depend on this epsilon then this is fine so, so it was instance for uniform distribution is it concentrated enough or it's not concentrated enough? So for most, uh, it depends on the parameters and the density, but usually, yes. Like usually it would be good enough to, to apply this things. Good. And this just let's remind ourselves includes regular graphs of arbitrary high degree, and this includes all dense graphs. Again, if my graph has epsilon fraction of all possible edges, it is almost regular in this sense of like a C, which is one over epsilon or something like this, right? Because the average degree is epsilon n. So in this setting, it seems that it's easy to get a constant approximation, right? Um, um, if you just want to get faster than two to the n? No, not exactly, but approximate. If I want to get uh, like a constant approximation and I still want an exponential algorithm just faster than two to the end, then yes, it's easy because I don't know, just uh, partition the vertex or something. Um, yes, okay. then the question is about exactly. This setting is specifically, can you get, uh, okay, let me take the question. Sure. And for the rest of the talk, most of what I want to discuss is the tools that we are using. So the main tools for the results that I mentioned is something called the hypergraph container method. This is some very powerful, relatively new, this is from the last decade or even a bit less uh, tool in combinatorics. It was discovered independently by Saxton and Thomason and by Valog, Morris and Samoti. Uh, Wojtek is usually here. Uh, both he and Yoji will be here next week. Now they are in uh, Oberwolfach, I think. Um, and in hindsight, the basic approach for what they are using, if you only care about graphs and not about hypergraphs, did appear before. So it appeared uh, in Kleitman and Wilson in the 80s and uh, more notably in uh, Sapuzenko's work in the early 2000s. It was not phrased in the same way, but now that you know the general thing, if you look back at their works, then they basically proved the, the same things for graphs rather than hypergraphs. And this was used very extensively in recent years in extreme uh, graph theory, in additive combinatorics, and in adjacent fields. And roughly, what they do is to characterize the structure of independent sets in nice hypergraphs. What do I mean by that? So they say something like, if H satisfies some conditions of being somewhat symmetric, <laughs> then the independent sets in H must be clustered together in some fashion. Let's try to see another version that is still not very rigorous, but slightly more rigorous. We want to say that if H is a nice hypergraph, then we have a collection of subsets of vertices. We are going to call these subsets containers, such that first of all, the collection is small. The number of containers we're having is going to be small. 
Second of all, each container is not very large, so its size should be bounded away from the number of vertices. It's at most one minus epsilon times the number of vertices. And less, which is the reason for the name containers, every independent set in the hypergraph, this is a set of vertices that doesn't contain a full edge within it, must be fully contained in one of the containers. So this is the clustering I was talking about. We have a small number of containers that fully contain all independent sets. This means that the independent sets need to be somewhat similar to each other because they are all contained in something small or one of a few small things. And we have some demonstration, but this is for graphs because I can't really draw hypergraphs. And also they are not really containers, but uh, let's go with it. We have these blobs that are supposed to be containers. Their number is small, three is a small number. Each of them is somewhat small. They are not covering the entire graph. And the point should be that if I have an independent set in my graph, then it must be fully contained in one of them. Good. And to make this a bit more rigorous, let's talk about graphs instead of hypergraphs for a bit, because then we can define exactly what nice means, what small means, and so on. Yes? One question. Uh, how do you avoid bootstrapping? What is nice in terms of the induced subgraph? Or why is the induced subgraph not nice? Very good question. So now let's see a rigorous definition for graphs, and then we can uh, discuss this uh, in the bit guy. So if G is a graph with n vertices, average degree D, and maximum degree that is bounded by a constant times D, so this is very similar to what we defined before as uh, almost regular. Then we have a collection of containers such that the following more rigorous uh, guarantees hold. First of all, we want the number of containers to be roughly two to the little o of n. But what exactly do I mean by this? So this little o of n would be parameterized by d, by the average degree. So this would be a function that if I divide by n would get to zero as d grows. So if d is super constant, this is really little o of n. Otherwise, this would just be meaning that for every epsilon, there is a large enough D such that if the average degree is larger than this, then this is at most two to the epsilon N or something like that. The size of the containers would be bounded away from the number of vertices with a constant that only depends on this constant. So it doesn't depend on N, it doesn't depend on the average degree. So if this is a real constant, then this is a real constant as well. And again, everything is fully contained in, uh, inside, uh, inside a container. So this is the rigorous version for, uh, for uh, graphs. And something that we can get for free in both this version and in the hypergraph version, we don't need to add anything to get this, is also the guarantee that every container is sparse. What do I mean by that? We want that if you look at the vertex set of the container, you look at the induced subgraph or induced sub uh, hypergraph on this container, then the number of edges is small. What is small? Smaller than some constant of pure choice, delta, let's think of it as very small, times the number of possible edges. And how do we get that? And this is going back again to a guy's question. The way we can get that for free is to just iteratively apply the same container lemma again and again. So as long as I have a container that is not sparse, the average degree didn't change by much. If it still has a lot of edges, then the average degree is still relatively high. The maximum degree also didn't uh, go up because it can't go up. So I can just apply it again. And we will not do the, the math, but because the containers get a bit smaller every time, then the number of containers would not grow by much because you would have some type of a geometric example. Because they, they get slightly smaller every time. And this goes back to your question that the place in which I will not be able to do this anymore is when they get too sparse. So now the average degree and the maximum degree can be very far apart from each other. Good. So yeah. just for my intuition, an empty graph would not have, like a graph without any edges would not have this problem. So the problem would be that if the average degree is very small, then the guarantee the here. Is so the problem is this guarantee. The, the number of, uh, okay, right. actually zero in particular is problematic, but okay. if you have anything that is not zero, then the only problem you can face is that if D is very small, you could have just a very large number of containers. Or oh, it could depend on the epsilon, right? C can be infinite. Uh, 
yeah, that's that's also cool. Fine. So if uh, yeah, maybe this is one way to avoid this without saying something about zero. Good. And this new condition that we added is actually in many times used to give better bounds on the size of containers. So let's see how we do that. Let's focus for a, for a few seconds on exactly regular graphs. So now they are not almost regular. Let's talk about deregular graphs for a bit and make the following observation. Maybe this is also somewhat related to Ishai's question. In a regular graph, independent sets cannot be larger than half of the vertices. Why is that? So the, the proof is simple. If we would look at our independent set and the rest of the graph, the graph is regular. This is an independent set. So all of the edges that touch this, uh, this side need to go to the other side. They need to cross this cut. There are D times the size of the independent set such edges. But on the other end, the graph is regular. So not more than D times the size of the other side can go into the other side, which means that this side is not larger than this side. So the extremal density, let's call it, of a subgraph that can be an, uh, an independent set is half of the vertices. If we have more than half of the vertices, we cannot be an independent set. And actually the same proofs gives us a bit more. So it gives us the following thing. If I have a subset of vertices that is slightly larger than this extremal density, that is half plus delta times uh, of size half plus delta fraction of the vertices, then the number of edges in the induced subgraph needs to be high needs to be delta fraction of all possible edges, of all of the edges in the graph. And why is that? This is exactly the same proof, right? This many edges need to go out of my subgraph. At most, this many edges can be eaten by the other side of the cut. And the edges that were not eaten by the other side of the cut are in my induced subgraph, or at least uh, half of them because I counted each one from both sides. So this is something that we are going to call super saturation meaning that if the density is slightly higher than the extremal density, then you don't only have one occurrence of what you try to avoid by many, but many of them. And if we just take the contrapositive of this statement, then we find out that if I know that some induced graph is sparse, it doesn't have a lot of edges, then it also needs to be small. Because if it was large, it would have a lot of edges. This means that if I'm talking about regular graphs, then adding this sparsity condition actually results in being able to say that all of the containers are of size roughly half. Because if they were larger than this, they would not be sparse. Good. So this, for example, gives us the following statement for free. The number of independent sets in a deregular graph is at most two to the half plus little o of one times n. Why? Because I can just take a union bound over all, the, all of the containers. The number of containers is small. It's two to the little o of uh, one times uh, and, and in each container, we'll just take all subsets of it. Good. And the next point, which, which is what made the hypergraph container lemma very powerful in comparison to just knowing these four graphs, is that almost every structure that you can define by forbidden substructures, you can describe as independent sets of some hypergraph. So let's see an example. If you look at the hypergraph that has a vertex for every possible edge, of Kn, meaning that for every i and j between one and n, I have a vertex in my hypergraph, I have a vertex corresponding to every possible edge in the graph on n vertices, and I add a free edge, so this is a free uniform hypergraph, for every triplet of edges that closes a triangle, then now what are subsets of the vertices of my hypergraph? These are just graphs. This is a collection of edges to put in my graph, and the collection of edges which is a subset of the vertices of my hypergraph, is an independent set if and only if it doesn't contain a triangle. So now independent sets are exactly triangle-free graphs. So exactly the same thing we just did would allow us to count the number of triangle-free graphs. And triangles here were not important. You could replace this with H-free graphs for every subgraph H. Uh, for example, if you want to go away from graphs, you could have an hypergraph where you have a vertex for each number between one to n, and have a k edge for every k arithmetic progression. And this would give you that the independent sets are exactly set sets without arithmetic progressions. So we, this would allow you, for example, to count how many arithmetic progression free sets I have. 
You can also think of things like anti-chains or anything that you can define by something small that I forbid everywhere. So this is one of the main uses that this was used for counting things or showing what things appear in a random graph and so on. And one of our main contributions is showing that you can apply this also algorithmically. So let's not discuss for a, for a second. This is somewhat easy for graphs, for hypergraphs. You need to look at it a bit more carefully. But let's say that we can build those containers uh, algorithmically as well, because this I didn't discuss so far. And let's ask ourselves, how can we use them if we are given the containers? So the easiest example we can think of is applying this for a problem in which we do have independent sets in the problem definition. So let's try to apply this for the maximum independent set problem. And the most natural way in which we can uh, apply this, and this would work, is to just enumerate over all of the containers. And in each container, we would solve maximum independent set on the induced subgraph on the container. Why does this work? Because the maximum independent set is an independent set. So it needs to be fully contained in one of the containers. So when we would run the, the maximum independent set algorithm on that container, we would find the maximum independent set. And on the other end, an independent set in an induced subgraph is still an independent set in the entire graph. So we didn't find anything that is larger than the maximum independent set. And what is the running time? The running time is roughly the number of containers times if we could solve maximum independent set in the general case in C to the n time. So this would take C to the size of the containers time, which uh, if for example, the, the graphs are uh, regular, this is half n instead of n. So this would give us uh, the following statement. If we can solve maximum independent set in C to the n time, then for D regular graphs, we can solve it in C half plus little o of one based on this D n time. And this leads us to the, to the following kind of intuition. Using containers, we can improve algorithms if we assume that the input is almost regular, but also we would need to assume something about the degrees, right? Because we still have this term that depends on the, on the degree. So we would want the degree to be higher or at least higher than some constant or something like this. But fortunately, for many of these problems, we do have faster algorithms for bounded degree uh, inputs. So this is why we stressed for a, for a graph coloring, for example, that we do have a faster algorithm if we assume that all of the degrees are bounded by a constant, regardless of what this constant is. So if you do have these two ingredients, both the containers and a faster algorithm for the bounded degree case, then you actually get an algorithm for the almost regular case, regardless of what the degree is. Right, because you can just choose one of the two algorithms if the average degree is small and the graph is almost regular then also the maximum degree is small and you can use the bounded degree case algorithm otherwise use the containers and the high degree case algorithm good something that comes up and i'm not going to talk specifically about the more involved algorithms for the other problems but something that comes up when you try to apply this for problems in which you don't care directly about an independent set but about other things it is that sometimes you would want to care about several independent sets at the same time. So one intuitive example would be the case of graph coloring. We mentioned that a graph is K colorable if and only if you can partition its vertex set to K independent sets, which means that I don't really care about one independent set. I can't solve some sub problem on a graph that contains only one independent set. I somewhat care about a collection of independent sets at the same time. At this k independence that describe the colorability. And this we don't get from the container uh, method, unfortunately. So it just tells us something about single independent sets and their structure. So something that, uh, that was very important to get those results is to generalize the container lemma to something that would give you information about collections of independent sets. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem like this should work. In what sense? I could have a graph that is bipartite, which would mean that two independent sets would cover everything, right? In a bipartite graph, I have two independent sets whose union is the entire graph. So if I would want containers to contain every sub, every collection of independent sets, this shouldn't work. Because even if I have two of them, they will not be contained in a single container unless it's the entire graph. But what we are able to show 
is that this is in a sense the only thing or the worst thing that can happen. So we prove the following statement, and this is what we call partition containers, which is that under the more or less same assumptions, we still get containers that are very similar. They, they still are, uh, the number of containers is still small. Each container is still somewhat small, but now we can guarantee the following thing. For every small collection of independent sets, there is some partition of this collection, meaning that I would take some of the independent sets in my collection to part A and some of the independent sets in my collection to part B, and two containers such that all of the independent sets in the first part are subsets are fully contained in the first container, and all of the independent sets in the second part are fully contained in the second container. Meaning that two containers are enough to cover, uh, to cover everything. And this tells us something about the structure of collections of independent sets, because this is not true in general for, uh, for collections of subsets. There are collections of, uh, of subsets of whatever set you want, such that you can't partition them to, to a part such that uh, neither part is covering everything. But for independent sets, this turns out to be true. And this shows that this is not only true for independent sets, but also it's true in the container manner. You can also get such containers. Yes. How does it affect R? How does it affect R? So it, it will be still like two to the little o of n, just with so words from R to the k, right? So it... Good. So you need to, yes. So you need to, that R would not depend on k. R can't go with, uh, with k. And this is true. So R, yes, still depends only on what it depended before and so on. Something that I didn't tell you is why does this help, right? I mean, it's still not clear that giving you two containers helps, but for some cosmic reason, a lot of problems that are parameterized are much easier for two than for things that are larger than two. Like in, for example, what we saw for a KSAT, for K coloring, and this somehow makes the fact that we have only two small containers good enough to still do non-trivial things, but that will allow us to get better algorithms the minute that you have more than two containers, uh, it wouldn't work for some reasons. It could show that then it would imply uh, bad things. Good, so let's summarize. This container method is a very, very powerful tool uh, from uh, extremal combinatorics. We show that it can also be used algorithmically. We use it to deduce that some problems are inherently easier on nice inputs, meaning that regardless of how hard they are to solve, they still would be easier on uh, inputs as long as they are nice. And also uh, in continuation of the discussion we had in the beginning, it gives us some formal justification to, uh, to a very natural intuition that CSPs, constraint satisfaction problems like coloring, like SAP, should be easier if you get more constraints. Some open problems. First of all, can we find more applications? for this uh, method, maybe in different areas, maybe not for exponential time uh, algorithms. Uh, I'm looking for them. I think that uh, this would be interesting to find. Also more specifically, the coloring thing became ridiculous by now, right? Because we know that you can do it in a, you can get an exponential improvement for every K if your graph is somewhat sparse, if it is somewhat dense, if it is somewhat regular. Actually, it is enough to include a subgraph that is somewhat regular. So um, hopefully this should be true in general and not only for these cases. And bigger open problems that are a bit more general than this that we should also care about is first of all, we are starting this line of arguments that are saying that regardless of what the current best algorithms are, for some entry complete problems, some inputs are inherently easy or easier than the worst case. Can we continue with this? Can we get some more or deeper understanding of which inputs are easy and which inputs are hard for uh, specific problems without saying anything about a specific algorithm? And another more general thing that we should care about is to refute or further base all of these conjectures about these running times that people are using for everything in fine grained complexity. Do we believe any of these conjectures? And just in time, I think that this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes.
So do all these reductions for festa exponential time regression give you festa polynomial time algorithms if you push them for the reductions no. not um in, so the problem so, is that usually it's on the other direction also uh, like it's an impossibility result yes so, is there any hope of using like yeah. assumptions that look like this for better polynomial running times the one of the main applications of the container method uh, that i didn't mention not uh, not related to tcs was to use this for um, analyzing random things I mean, this gives you, in a sense, a nice way to get a very cheap union bound. So one application that wouldn't involve anything exponential and does sound somewhat reachable is to use this to analyze randomized algorithms, because this gives you some tool to analyze random processes without paying as much as a large union bound, because now you only bound over a small number of containers. So I, I would say that this is maybe the... I think I would have the highest hope for to get easy polynomial time algorithms using this. Yes? Can you say a word about the idea behind the algorithm for finding the containers? For finding the containers? So, okay, the way that the proof works, and actually maybe I'll go back to the point that uh, in hindsight, the graph version is much easier than, than we thought. Like if you are trying to take it out of the old papers and to write it with, uh, with this type of uh, formulation, then it's easy to state and easy to prove. In the recent versions of the uh, Nogas book, of the Lord Spencer book, there is a uh, like one page proof for the graph version. For the algorithmic? So when you look at the graph version, it's quite easy to turn this algorithmic because the way it works is something of the following form. You show that in every independent set, you have some very small, subset of vertices in it that you would call the fingerprint of this independence set, such that using the small fingerprint, you can expand it to what we would call the container. And then the way that you can generate containers is to just enumerate over these small possible fingerprints and to pass them through this expansion function, which would be polynomial. So actually it's not only algorithmic, but we can even show that we have a polynomial time algorithm that given an index of a container would give you the container. More questions? Okay, so let's thank you all again.